So I wanted to show just the basics of testing, the sort of things you're going to be looking for, how you're going to be testing them. And to do that, I use like a really simple game RPG example. So I'm just going to go ahead and open that up. Oops. Uh, <laughs> OK, so in this directory, we have three files. There's the readme, there's the actual code, and then there's the test. Um, we're going to open up teeth. <clears throat> the idea with the game is that you have teeth, and you have, like, instead of hit points, you have enamel points, and you can eat as much sweets until your enamel completely erodes, and then you get a cavity error. So if we look around, we see, okay, well, cavity error needs a sugary thing to tell us what gave us a cavity. Um, teeth just takes enamel for the amount of enamel points. And then there's a consume function for consuming a sugary thing. And then we have our sugary thing itself. So basically what we really have is we have teeth, which is an integer to decrement from. We have a sugary thing, which is the thing doing the decrementing. And we have a cavity error for when we consume too much candy. So if we open up our test, I started the beginnings of testing our choppers. Um, as you see, I start off our teeth with 16 enamel. I create a bunch of various kinds of sweets. Um, it's really good to not just, if you're going to test instantiation, that you give several examples of different ways it can be instantiated within your test. Um, and then I try consuming all the items one by one. And every time I'm checking to make sure that the math is done correctly. Um, so we're making sure that whenever we consume a candy item, that it's taking away from our health or our chopper's health or enamel. And then right here, uh, we're specifically testing to make sure that we get a cavity error if we push our teeth over the edge by eating one more piece of candy. So you see uh, it's t soda does 10 damage, and then sweet tarts do 5, and dark chocolate does 1. So by the time it gets to the cavity error, it should have about 1 HP or 1 enamel. And then if it takes one more away, because that's the value for the dark chocolate, it's going to raise a cavity error because there's no enamel left. So that's, so we just use this with context, and it just says, make sure that everything in this, make sure whatever in this with statement actually raises a cavity error. And it's really important to test uh, exceptions that you're making. It's really important, yeah, it's, it's just really important that exceptions are really well documented and that they, that they themselves don't err, which can be a thing. Um, I guess to get more in depth, another thing we could do would be like testing the instantiation of cavity error. And there's a lot of other things you could do. You could, you could have it set up so that it like automatically builds sugary things to eat and you could there, there's a lot of different ways to approach it, depending on how complicated you want to make the game. So that's one of the repositories that are online for you to just kind of clone and fiddle around with. Uh, I think it comes with a challenge, or is this just an example? Let's see. Okay, this one's just an example. But uh, I went over the repository that I made last time, the coin flip test. And I just polished it up, so it should be a lot easier to experiment with. It just focuses entirely on Pi testing the coin flip application. And then it comes with a challenge, which is to build a die roll program 
based off of these, based off of this model and testing that die roll program. And then it comes with some resources and that kind of thing. Um, let's actually test some stuff though. So I'm sure most of you are familiar by now to actually test something. We're going to run pi.test and then test.py and we see that everything passed and everything's expected. So part of our tests is a test generally works by testing to see if your test raises an exception. So if I use assert enamel equals equals six and it doesn't, it will raise an exception, the test will break. So I'll change this to something that's false, like one. And then we'll go ahead and run the tests again. And then we can see, oh, that line where I changed it to one from six, it's saying assert six equals equals one because choppers.enamel at that point in time is six. So we can go back. It even gives you a line number, I think. Yep, 21. So we can just go ahead and jump to line 21, and then there's our error. Um, what else? I, th I, I think those two things would be really good to fiddle around with. Um, but I think that covers all of the basics that I'd want to get around to. We can kind of dive into um, some of the murkier waters of PyTest, uh, some caveats that I ran into with PyTest. Um, like, for example, certain installations of PyTest won't doc test certain things. So, like, you'll, you'll read in the doc test API, oh, it's supposed to work like this, and then you'll run PyTest, the current version, and it won't use some of those features. Like last time I was trying to use like the ellipsis white space and so on and so forth and apparently like the, uh, I think it's the brew Python just doesn't, I'm not sure what the problem is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that can happen. So it can be useful to just manually use the test mod function rather than running it through PyTest because that assures that if somebody else, for example, runs into the problem that I still haven't figured out with my computer, that you can still run the tests and the PyTests. I have a question. Yeah. When you were um, putting together the sample repo, did you, did you do TDD, did you write the test first or did mm -hmm. you write the... Yeah, I wrote the tests first and then I awesome. based I based everything. I, I think that's a really good model because whenever you design something, you want to be focused on how are people going to interact with this? What is the ideal way for this abstraction to exist? Because you don't... One of the worst things that I see is like somebody using a language like Python and then like using it as if it's C or something and not really using the power of extra abstractions to kind of simplify that process. And I feel like through testing, instead of like building an architecture, seeing if it works or whatever, and then like failing or succeeding, through TDD you can have a really general idea of like how you build things in a test and then it's kind of like duct typing in that like, oh, if I make an abstraction that works like this, then this other thing I'm trying to do won't work. So it's, it's, it's a good way to uh, catch errors before they even exist and before you write, even start writing code. So it's good architecturally. And then it's just really nice to like, you know, when, you, when you're done making a huge commit, you, it's always like, oh, now I gotta go write the tests. So. I don't want to put you on the spot, so feel free to say let's uh, try this a different time, but um, I think it might be worth considering um, just showing what that looks like to do TDD. So I recently heard a, a podcast that kind of got under my skin because somebody was claiming to be a, a testing guru and they were 
saying things that didn't really make sense. But um, one of the things that came out of there that did actually make pretty good sense to me was one of the things, one of the barriers to getting into like TDD or even just unit testing in general is the so the first step of TDD is you write a broken test, right? And that's unless you've done it before, that that's something that's just like, wait, that doesn't make sense. So you know, in in this podcast they said, you know, I don't know how to write a broken test. And I think they didn't understand that writing a broken test doesn't mean you wrote a, you wrote a bad test, you just wrote a test that isn't going to pass because yeah. it hasn't been implemented yet. It's scaffolding. Exactly. Yeah. So I think yeah. Okay, yeah, we can we can go over that. Um what would be a cool example? I think if we if we did a, a function to add enamel to your teeth, like if you if you Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. To the dentist yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Oh. oh. No, that's not that. Okay. All right. All right, so we're going to test adding enamel. All right. Seems pretty reasonable. We're going to say that our teeth have a, we'll just call it brush function, and then the integer will be how many enamel points we'll be giving to the teeth. And then we'll assert choppers dot enamel equals that would be five because it's at zero and then we want a function that increases it by five which is choppers dot brush and then if it works successfully we'll know that choppers dot enamel needs to be five so let's go ahead and open up our RPG Can we go ahead and run the test real quick? Oh, to, yeah, of just course. That's a good that idea. Yeah. It's a good test. It's just going to fail right now because we haven't implemented it yet. There we go. See, no attribute brush because we haven't created the brush method yet. So let's, let's build a faulty brush first. This also helps a lot with implementation because sometimes you think you've implemented something right and then like you test it in this other way and it's like, oh, it's completely wrong. Do, 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 do. Okay. So let's add our brush method to our teeth class. Actually, let's just do that. We'll make that the error. Uh, yeah. OK, so here's that function, brush our teeth gain enamel. OK, so we're going to go ahead and test this. We should get an error, but a different one. OK, now we see that brush takes exactly one argument, um, but we were given two. It's saying that because Python automatically, auto magically gives you the self argument when you're dealing with classes, which is kind of confusing and silly. But um, Let's go ahead and, do, does anyone have any questions about this? Cool. Um, let's go ahead and edit brush and make it actually work. Doo -doo. Let's see. There we go. So as you recall, the error was that it basically didn't have enough arguments. And of course, all we have here is self. So we actually need to add points. And then all we're doing is we're adding points to enamel. 
which I'm using the plus equals operator for, which is the same as saying enamel equals points plus enamel. And this should pass completely. Yay! And that's how you do test-driven development. Yay! I think that I think that's that's all for now. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> oh, again, uh, everything's on our tutorial repo. So give that a clone. Check it out. There's some challenges. If you have any tips or if you want to add your own challenges, uh, just hit me up on Slack and we can work on that together. Or if you have any questions, you can just pull me aside so we can do like a one-on-one -on -one for testing or whatever. So I'm kind of new to the whole testing realm. You're assuming that enamel equals zero when you get to your brush function because obviously it's set above there. Is that okay in the test because you know it's going to be zero, but it's mm -hmm. not reflecting a real life um, situation because enamel could be whatever it is. Because I could brush my teeth right now before I eat my dark chocolate. Wait, how many? Well, I, I, you know, it's zero right now, but I could brush my teeth right now before I go and eat my chocolate. So then I would have oh. whatever plus five, so it would be the, it wouldn't be zero. So yeah, if, if, if brush were a little bit higher up, then we'd be asserting choppers dot enamel equals five okay. instead of zero. Okay, uh, but so that's fine for t TDD. But okay, I see what you're saying. Cool. Oh. Yeah, ideally you'd split everything up into like multiple directories and even better yet, instead of like manually specifying um, we're creating a chocolate bar and that takes one health to just like auto-generate a bunch and then have it auto-feed to it and having like separate functions or separate test files for testing consuming stuff have a separate file for testing, uh, brushing your teeth, and so on and so forth. You could have, you could have a file that just tests your instantiation of things, which I've done before. That's pretty useful. Um, so usually, when you look at a repo, you'll see a directory that's called tests, and then it's it's like the same as what we're doing now. It's just you just run pi dot test on the directory name, and then it runs all the files starting with tests or something. Are there any other questions? Cool. Do you have anything else to share with us today? Yes. Okay. Excellent. If you do do iterative tests, um, like you're testing and generating things over and over and over, be super duper ultra careful of immutability and like keeping things from the last iteration, because that can really fudge your results. Yep. That's all. <laughs> awesome. Any final thoughts, questions from anyone? Cool. Thank you so much, Lily. Mm -hmm. And again, this will be shared. I'll, I'll share the recording of this um, in the Slack channel this afternoon or as soon as I get it uploaded after the meeting. And feel free to bring up any questions you have there.